Um, I, I have a question. Yes. Is that a question before we begin or a question this that is a begins? Question. This is a beginning question. We're and beginning. It, it's, we're beginning. <laughs> and okay. it, it's to Ray and Simon, and it is this. So you both started this project, now called um, The Glorious Death of Comrade What's-His-Name, before I came on board at the yes. BMI workshop. And I want to know, uh, why, why did you choose the source material, which is a play called The Suicide by Nikolai Erdman, to work on? I was the one who brought it to the table for Simon and I. We were looking. We had just decided to work together on a uh, piece, but we didn't know what piece. We just liked working with each other, right? Or at least I like working with you, and maybe <laughs> there's no other options. <laughs> I doubt that. But uh, I had on that on my shelf. I had that uh, that play, which I first saw in 1994 at a director's. Uh, in a director's pre presentation, director's class presentation. And I just thought it was hysterical then. It was a part that I wanted to play. And, uh, and then I just thought, I wonder if we could do this. Mostly I just loved it because it was funny. Uh -huh. But funny in that kind of like, I'm angry about this, which is, you know, powerful, horrible, horrible thing that goes on in society but I'm gonna do it funny, which Erdman was just brilliant at. So I, I handed that to Simon and I said, what do you think? What did you say? Did you say yes? I think so, yes. Yeah. I didn't think it was the worst play I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> That's a promising start. Also, it's a, I mean, it's a full length play. Unlike, <laughs> unlike by the way, all my other suggestions. Right? Yeah, that's it. Like, <laughs> I don't know if it, three acts or four acts or something. But I mean, did you know that it was going to be this epic undertaking? Or was it originally planned to be a full length musical is really what I'm asking. Or were you thinking, uh, oh, we'll just steal a few bits? No, I thought we could maybe just uh, easily swap over, you know, take it scene by scene and musicalize each scene. Oh, okay. And I began to realize, well, we want to change so many very deeply uh, time-specific jokes and time specific, you know, eras, era issues and stuff that, that weren't relevant. And I thought, well, okay, well, we'll change that, we'll change this. And when Simon and I started tearing it apart, we realized it falls apart and we can't put it, we didn't know how to sew it back together again. <laughs> and we worked on that for quite some time until we, I said, we desperately need David Bridell to come in and help us. <laughs> that was the worst decision you've ever made. True. And now we've been locked in this nightmarish uh, scenario for years, a few years. It is a long time. Um, no, I don't think we entirely believed that uh, it was going to be easy. But I didn't know that it would be this, that we would do this much rewriting. That's what I'll say. Yeah. And then as that started to happen and we got you involved, what did you think when you first got it? Because we sent it to you and said, help us. I'm actually trying to remember at that point how many songs had been written when I came on board. And I think it was probably about four or five. Is that yeah, probably true. And they were all great. I probably, probably three or four of them, we, we, didn't, we still aren't in the show anymore. Uh, well, really passes at, at the things that we decided to try. Yeah, yeah. But I, all I remember is thinking, this is very funny and and wonderful, and uh, and I want to be a part of it. Simon, did you have any? Did you think when you started writing the music, oh, this this should have a certain kind of sound, and this is the sound that I'm going to use to write this score. I think I I always listen to a lot of Stravinsky, just out of habit, and Prokofiev. So I never really thought it would be anything other than that. Yeah. I, I did start listening to a lot of Soviet era music, uh, which is actually quite um, stirring. Yeah. And, uh, if you listen to the Soviet national anthem, it's quite quite brilliant. I I stole yeah. bits of it. 
for certain numbers. But I, I you know, it was always that. You know, the uh, big copyright people, they're going to come after us. Now. No, <laughs> like I stole five modes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and in no particular order. <laughs> yeah i listen uh, it so happens unrelated to this project i'm a huge fan of both stravinsky and shostakovich and um and there's certain shostakovich symphonies that i'm just mad about and uh and yeah that's i guess that sound is part especially when you think of a number like ipod to kolnikov it's very yeah the yeah. thing i like about the music that Simon started to bring, one of the many things that I like about the music Simon started bringing in was that it was, it was not pastiche. It was not just a, let's, no. do a, 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 let's mimic that stuff, but it was somehow yeah. informed by it, but also felt like to a certain extent, old fashioned musical theater in some yeah. way that matched the tone of the piece. I mean, old fashioned in the, in the greatest uh, sense. Not, not the, Golden age is what you mean. Yes. Thank you. I'm the lyricist, I should have better words. <laughs> uh, so it all feels like it belongs in some other era, but also we did that with the play. We, we took the play, which was very 1928 Soviet Union, and we kind of extracted anything that was overt, you know, too overtly uh, attached to that time period. And, uh, and we just tried to, to, to drag out the universal stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, we were we were I think trying to do that from the very beginning, and that's why I think Simon started down that road with the music. It wasn't meant to be very Russian, but yeah. it tinged with that, and that's where it's from. So, yeah. But yeah, we wanted to get the stuff that the, the kind of the hardest stuff that was making me laugh. There were a lot of, um, like I said, very specific jokes. There's one party scene, and one of the women just idly says to another one, "Oh, you were you were in Paris. Tell me what's the 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 style in breasts these days." And the woman said, "Each according to her means." <laughs> so maybe if you know that slogan and that those facts about communism that were being pushed around at that time, that must have been a killer joke back then in the original Russian in 1988. Right. <laughs> but we weren't going to use those kind of jokes or those kind of characters for that matter. So well, early on, I should say very early on that the the idea that we'd be performing this at 54 Below uh, on January 20th, by the way, get your tickets now, uh, uh, didn't quite occur to us that it would be in, that we'd be performing in a cabaret kind of environment. And that's what we want to do with production. We want to, we want to yeah. do it in a room with tables where you can buy your vodka because so much of the thing takes place there. So I think we wrote it very, I, in my mind, I was always thinking kind of proscenium, uh, you know, your classical, your classic proscenium musical theater. Did you have those, do you have those kind of thoughts, David, when you, when you write and set things? And uh, with this piece, it's gonna no. look like on stage. Yeah, not so much with this one. I have to say, I had a little bit of a image of Zero Mostel running around, but that, I think that we might have just referenced that uh, ourselves at some point early on. But, um, uh, and so then I thought a little bit about, you know, funny thing happened on the way to the forum and some of those yeah. references were in my mind. And so I was probably just thinking at a, about a fairly mainstream presentation. But <clears throat> now that we've, kind of gone further into the piece and shifted more in the direction of what you describe, like a possibly a more intimate setting, certainly a kind of a warm, bustling, you know, um, cabaret style event. Um, then I do think that fits what we have written very nicely. Um, so I like and the way we recall. Simon was, began working on the orchestrations and <clears throat> much, much later, of course, in the game, but uh, you, we were talking about what it could be. And when you play the piano parts, I'd always envisioned quite a lot of musicians because somehow or other, you, your fingers sound like 10 musicians. And, and so I was, I was thinking big. But you, I asked you and you were like, no, I think about four or five people could do it. And now we've gotten it down to, well, for this concert, we've got just three people. 
But those people are extraordinary because one of them is Paul Woodyell, who's just one of the great uh, violinists, and he sounds like an orchestra when he plays. And then the other is this uh, Marcus Rojas, who's a tuba player, who can make his tuba sound like a cello or uh-huh. you know, or a trumpet. Like it's extraordinary the the depth and breadth of that he can do with that instrument. So. And then, of course, you know, Fred's playing piano and it all sounds really full, but you can get right next to it, you know, the idea of being in a, in a cabaret space and there's, you know, a tuba guy playing this tuba just a couple of feet from you is, is really fun and it makes you feel, like you said, warm and, and, and much more intimate than I, than I had originally envisioned. Yeah. We had to have a tuba in it. We were sort of forced down that road because it, it's in the damn story. Yeah. It's not the first instrument I would pick for it, but it's actually brilliant. It's, it's perfect for the style of the comedy of the mm-hmm. show. And, and so I'm very glad we got one. Yeah. What, what makes something perfect for the style of... The, the, what makes a tuba perfect for the style of the show? No. So full of hot air. <laughs> you know, it's like... It's, like <laughs> it, it's overblown. <laughs> It's ridiculous, and it's it's really loud, and it doesn't overstay its welcome, though. You know, it's it's a, a, a warm sound as well. Yeah, uh, it's very much like Temian. Yeah, yeah. Really <laughs> yeah, full of hot air, all of the stuff overblown. <laughs> so Ray, when you talk about the jokes that don't work. Uh, now now which is you know i mean years ago we i think we kind of overcame that hurdle by writing new jokes or doing a you know fairly heavy editing job on the source material but it prompts me to ask this question why why in our view should we bother to tell this story now you know it was written in a very specific time and place with very specific references and a certain kind of pressure on the on the author and artists like him late 1920s Soviet Russia, where Stalin was just consolidating power and things were pretty tricky for a lot of people. Um, so what, what sort of supersedes that time and place and becomes relevant to this time and place? You asking Simon? I'm asking, all, I'm asking all of us, but I'm gonna stay quiet while you can talk. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> Um, I would say that it's grown, unfortunately, in the last uh, you know few years. I don't want to get too far down that road, but I think the the, the let me put it this way: the notion that uh, the the little guy is 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 feels helpless, uh, you know, when looking and shaking his fist at the uh, at the powers that be, and you now that's not necessarily political. I'm feeling it a lot these days personally, but I think a lot of people were feeling it before the current uh, American administration and they felt like little guys shaking their fist and not able to be heard and not able to uh, advance the, the, their causes. So that's kind of the universal thing that we plucked out of it. But at the time, I remember when we, when we picked the play, Simon and I had this many long conversations about like, well, why are we doing this and why, why would we and why now and and i think we we it was it was less political it was much less political our reasons and much more you know that that the, the feeling of being helpless in a, in a world where uh, things are out of your control and you're you know and are affecting your life so that image of the overblown uh guy with hot air trying to make a difference in you know <laughs> calling Stalin on the phone and, and you know shouting at him was uh, which happens in the original play it just it just rang to me as something really important and I couldn't quite put my finger on it that was my experience anyway and it's just gotten more and more and even the kind of Russianness of it, it doesn't uh, doesn't hurt its current relevance hmm. what do you think Simon well, we we started writing it ten years ago, nine years ago. It was a couple of administrations ago. We really like that it was in a very different political climate. 
And I think there was a sense of, of hopelessness back then as well. And the, the sense of, you know, the, this, he gets to call Stalin. He speaks to Stalin on the phone and he can't say anything. He says a lot of crap and he he's insults his height and, and his, uh, <laughs> you know, he, and I think, you know, I, I'd probably be the same faced with, <laughs> with I was in front of, you know, somebody I loathed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's brilliant. I, I think it was that scene that hooked me, I think. You know. <laughs> yeah, very much me too, I think. You meet with a world leader and you suddenly become a bumbling, inarticulate booby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can relate to this. <laughs> Being a bumbling or, you know, booby. <laughs> what, about, uh, what about you, David? Oh, uh, well, I agree with the above. I also feel, and I've, I mean, uh, you know, as you know, I've had this sort of long running fascination with clowns and, and, uh, and uh, part of my work and career is all centered around that particular kind of comic archetype. So I was very drawn to, that, to this play for that reason, because it's about, you know, someone who in a way is like a, has all, exhibits all the tendencies of a clown. Um, <clears throat> who is stuck in this um, authoritarian nightmare. And I love the fact that the play, or the original story, I think has a universal truth in it, which is that sort of versions of chaos represented in this piece by Semyon and versions of order represented in this piece by the totalitarian state are always in some kind of conflict and some kind of flux and and or, audience is kind of, oh, what is that, Ray? Your doorbell? I wish it uh, was uh, not a telephone. I uh, wish I had a better excuse. No, it's just a phone. Yeah. Um, audiences are always, I think, drawn to, to, I think they're drawn to that conflict in general because it's both micro and macro. We feel it in our domestic lives and we feel it in our political lives. And, um, and I think it's also uh, something that is kind of, an audience kind of chooses sides, let's put it that way. And usually they choose the side of the underdog. And that is as true now as it was then and as it will be a hundred years from now. It's just a human sort of mm, tendency. And I love that about this story. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So, That's those yeah, really well said. I think it's still current. <clears throat> yeah, that's really well said, and it's one reason that I haven't gotten tired ever of working on it. Uh, mm -hmm. And audiences always seem to be whenever we've done readings and stuff, people are, are <clears throat> attached, and you know, uh, and you hear screams of laughter that are uh, uh, even I, I would say pretty cathartic, yeah. more so than your average laugh. I think they're. They're delicious laughs. They're the kind of laughs you get when you see Groucho attacking, you know, the guy who just beat Harpo. And then yeah. Groucho steps in and starts making fun of him. And it's like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you see these uh, these authorities and that system kind of being being attacked. And it, it fuels the, the, the comedy in a way that I think is just delicious. Yeah. So we're going to do yeah. this. We're going to do this. I think we probably should start... Uh, wrapping this up even though i could do it forever oh let me just say one other thing you just yeah, me, though, and that is this that um uh curiously enough in addition to the sort of political relevance if you like of the story now i also just think from the point of view of an audience member who's looking for something to do on an evening you know in times of uh excessive stress uh, in society, comedies are famously more, you know, more popular. Mm. So for, for those of a sort of liberal inclination five, 10 years ago under the, uh, um, in the Obama administrations, it's, it was kind of the same thing as satire is what I'm trying to say. Satire becomes so much more pointed yeah. when, when the, you know, whoever's in charge is kind of, um, 
setting a path that opens itself up to um, to being satirized. So I feel like our story right now is something that an audience can get behind just because everyone needs to release that tension. You know? Right. And it's fairly universal in its uh, d uh, discussed with uh, authoritarianism. I, uh, you know, yeah. first of all, they're angry at Stalin. They're angry at a socialist yeah. you know, and communist uh, view. Yeah. And so it really is just about the little guy and how he gets trampled and, you know, what, what we all feel like. I think it's a great uniter in, in, in that way. This, I do too. Yeah. To laugh about those things together. Um, yeah, man, January 20th with this cast that's crazy. You know, you guys have both uh, seen Jackie uh, yeah. and worked with her as, as uh, Jackie Hoffman's uh, playing Serafina, uh, which is, um, some of it was written with her in mind, actually. We, mm -hmm. we, uh, I remember she joined the company a while ago for a reading and she, we said, we've got to write her a different song, Simon and I. <laughs> this is a pretty good song for that character, but then we just tossed the whole thing out and, and wrote a whole new song for her. Yeah. And uh, uh, just so many great people. Drew McBeady is, is playing uh, the big bad guy and he's been in everything on Broadway. I think, I think probably everything mm -hmm. Broadway started. It. At least 12 shows. And um, John Jellison and Jim Borselman, who are just both legends, and I think it's going to be great. Good. Yeah. All right, Thanks, everybody. It's yeah. Nice talking to you. Yeah. Nice talking to you guys. We'll see you on the, in our next uh, Zoom session. Yeah. Let's get to work on the on the new one. Don't exactly. talk. About it. Don't tell anybody <laughs> what it is. We want secret, and it's going to be great. But uh, yeah, make it that.